All right, welcome everyone. My name is Dave Scott. Uh, I'm, okay, my is my mic. My mic is on, right? It's loud. You guys can all hear me real loud. Okay. Um, I'm. I work at UC Health. I used to work at Children's Hospital. You might have known me from there um, for a long time. I worked there, and then this year, um, January, I moved to UC Health. So if you know where the campus is, they're right across the street from each other. So I didn't really move that far. Um, one thing I wanted to say. And I, I, when I went to UC Health orientation, they brought this up at the orientation, and I wanted, to, and I thought, this, oh wow, that's really cool. It kind of like really pertains to what all of us do every day. What is integrity? Anyone? Answers? Question? This me asking you a question. You hopefully are answering my question. What is integrity? Yeah. That's good. Anyone else? No? Doing the right thing every time, all the time. That's good. I like that. Anybody else have what think what is integrity? So in the class that I went to, the orientation class, um, one of the definitions that there was a lot of definitions, just like kind of like what we had here. One of the definitions was doing the right thing when no one's looking. And pretty much, isn't that what our job is every day? Like well, a lot of time, the stuff that we do, it's like they're counting us to do the best job that we can and the best, get everything working the best as we can. And no one's really there watching us to see what we're doing. It's us, our integrity is what's making us do the best job that we can just because that's part of our job. So I always thought that was really cool. Like since I went to that orientation and it's been a long time since I've been to an orientation. And that's maybe the one thing I remember from orientation. And I don't remember any of the other stuff. Other than there's like this page that they call the source that that's where everything is that you could ever want to know about work. It's all on the source. Where, where is that? At? Oh, look at the source. Look at the source. Everything's the source. So those are the two things I learned from orientation. But I thought that integrity thing was really good for what we do as biomeds every day. Um, and we're always hopefully in here have really good integrity and we do the right thing even when no one's looking. Today, our objectives, things that we're going to talk about cardiac structure. Oh, I guess I don't have to talk so loud because I have this microphone. Electrophysiology, heart related vital signs, ECG recording, PM pointers, troubleshooting. First up, we have cardiac structure. The heart is made of four chambers there's two atrium, which are the filling chambers, and two ventricles, which are the pumping chambers. The atrium are at the top of the heart, ventricles are at the bottom of the heart. Physically, like as we are oriented, you know, as a human being, top and bottom. Two septums, septum is the wall that's between the heart, that divides the right side and the left side. And it, it divides the right atrium from the left atrium, and the right ventricle from the left ventricle. So that's called the septum in the, in the middle there. And you might have heard of maybe a um, ASD or a VSD before, atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect. That's sometimes the atrial septal defect is diagnosed as a heart murmur. And that's in kids a lot of the time, it's a hole between the septum. And they actually have a procedure now that they can do through the femoral vein or femoral artery that they go in through that artery into the heart, um, which we'll talk about that artery in a minute when we talk about the flow kind of the return. Um, but they, they can deploy this little like parachute thing and put it in like, kind of like a rivet in between the walls and then the tissue grows around it and clogs that uh, septal defect. Because that septum, that between the left side and the right side, the right side is deoxygenated blood, the left side is oxygenated blood. So if you have a hole in between, it's pumping deoxygenated and oxygenated blood, it's kind of mixing in there, which is not good. So that's kind of a big deal when we have a septal defect. Four one-way valves, the tricuspid, the mitral, the pulmonary, and the aorta. I have a little sitting here. The valves, try to be right. I get a lot of the sayings I have from nursing people. And nursing people that I used to work with, the nursing people that originally helped with the CBET program that we did through CabMed for so many years. Um, so try to be right. What does that mean? 
it means that the tricuspid valve is on the right side. So it's between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And then pulmonary, that tells you that the kind of pulmonary that has something to do with the lungs, right? So that the pulmonary vein is the lungs. A, what is your aorta? Anybody? Aorta? aorta is the main artery that pumps out to the body. So our arteries are usually a little bit of artery and A for a way. It's pumping blood away from the heart. And veins return blood to the heart. We'll look at that when we look at circulation. So that leaves the mitral valve. The mitral valve is between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So try to be right, it's on the right hand side. Pulmonary is your, going to your, your lungs, aorta is going to your body, and the mitral is between the left ventricle and the left atrium. Process of elimination, kind of. You'll know the different veins, if you could remember that. If you can try to be right when you're trying to answer the valves questions. And maybe you're, you will see this again at work, maybe not. I work in uh, at UC Health now, I work in the CT ICU. That's the cardiothoracic ICU. And so I get a lot of questions, cardiac questions. I'm like, man, this is great. You know, like I, I really like cardiac and that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this class. And um, it kind of, uh, like I'm able to answer these questions based on the knowledge that I have from doing all these classes and, and based on studying this a little bit. So this is cardiac structure. I just put this up here because I kind of like the block diagram. Being a biomed tech, I guess I'm used to looking at block diagrams rather than pictures of the heart. Because pictures of the heart, I kind of look at it and go, oh, you know, like, I guess I can kind of see the different chambers there. Or, you know, you don't really know. Um, but this I can definitely see, right atrium, right ventricle. Um, here it says semi ulnar valve, which is the pulmonary um, valve. Pulmonary artery. Remember, arteries carry blood away. And if you look at these, they're all colored. Probably jumping ahead of myself a little bit too much, which I got some other slides coming on here. But this is called pulmonary circulation, the part that goes to the veins. And then this part is called systemic circulation, the part that goes to the body, which we'll look at in just a minute on these other slides. So cardiac pump, right side of the heart. And the reason why these are blue, blue stands for deoxygenated by my slides. So if you look at that next slide, you can follow the arrows. Blue is deoxygenated. Red, red is oxygenated, so it has oxygen. Right side of the heart, inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, IVC, SVC. Vena cava is another name for a vein. It's a big vein, very big vein. So inferior is the bottom part of your body. And superior is the top part of your body. So everything from the top part of your body flows through that superior vena cava and then into the heart and everything from the bottom from the inferior vena cava into the heart, including that femoral vein that I was talking about. The femoral vein eventually gets into that inferior vena cava. That's the one that goes that I was talking about. The, um, ASD, the atrial septal defect, and also for cath procedures, that's what they use a lot is that femoral vein, and they go up through the vein up into the heart, and they can do a lot of procedures non-invasively into the heart by using just these bigger veins or arteries in the body without having to crack the chest open. So from the inferior superior vein came, it flows into the right atrium, which we said was a filling chamber. Through that tricuspid valve, tri to be right valve, right ventricle, which is pumping, so that's going to be pumping somewhere. Where is it pumping to? It's pumping to the to the lungs from the right, the right ventricle, and it pumps through the pulmonary artery, through that pulmonary vein that we talked about. So arteries carry blood away, right? So normally blood carrying away from the body is oxygenated blood, right? Why this one? This one's deoxygenated. So that's not only your arteries in the body that carry deoxygenated blood are your pulmonary arteries. So every other artery is carrying oxygenated blood, except for that pulmonary. And we'll see the same thing kind of on the pulmonary vein is oxygenated blood coming back. So for the pulmonary artery, deoxygenated blood goes to the lungs, to the right ventricle. 
In the lungs is where it gets the oxygen. It becomes oxygenated blood. It becomes red blood. Oxygenated. All blood's red, right? But for our, our purposes, oxygen is the red part. Oxygenated blood um, comes back into the left atrium, which is a filling part of the heart, left atrium chamber. I think they're recording this, so I know you're taking a lot of notes, but hopefully we'll have recording we can watch too on the um, be publishing website. So from the uh, pulmonary pulmonary veins comes back in from the lungs. It's red. So veins normally carry blood back into the heart. So these veins are the only veins carrying oxygenated blood in the body. All other veins carry deoxygenated blood. To the left atrium, which is a filling, filling part, part of the through the mitral valve, which was kind of that valve that we had left over. We didn't know what all the other ones were. We did try to be right, a aortic, pulmonary, and we had mitral valve left over. Mitral mitral valve is in the left atrium to the left ventricle. So the left ventricle <coughs> is the main pumping part of your heart. It's actually the biggest part of your heart. It's the most muscular part of your heart. The left hand side because that has to pump out to your whole body that's called systemic circulation here see the, these pictures like this they don't make as much sense to me as that block diagram thing that i had earlier that's why i guess that's part of being like a bioed person having a block diagram of things and having arrows and like that thing like this i look at this thing i look at it just kind of looks like a bunch of nothing to me this part down the middle here that's the septum because we have left ventricle here, we have right ventricle here. So this part down the middle would be the septum, the part that divides the two sides, right and left side of the heart. So I got the black diagram up here again. This one, this one's a little bit different than the other one, but kind of the same thing. Um, if we look here, the oxygenated blood <coughs> comes from the body to the vena cava, superior and inferior, so bottom and top. Down to the, to the tricuspid valve, right, right ventricle that's pumping, pumping to the lungs, pulmonary circulation, pulmonary artery, back to pulmonary vein, back O2 rich here, back into the filling part, left atrium, through that, through that valve, the tricuspid valve, or sorry, um, mitral valve, into the left ventricle, which is the pumping part. Do the aortic valve, do the aorta to the body. This part is called systemic circulation. So we have two different types of circulation pulmonary and systemic. So that's great that we have all that, but we know that our heart beats at a normal beat, has a normal rhythm to it. And it can go up and down, and it can also change the amount that comes out of the heart each, with each pumping action. So this automatic thing is called automaticity. So I said that right. Um, the mechanism for a normal heart rhythm. It's controlled by the nervous system, just like all muscles. The heart is a muscle made up of cardiac tissue. So is it an EKG or an ECG? Or an ECG or EKG? What's that? Right, that's kind of the right answer, Marty. So um, when I look at it, I call it EKG because when I was taught ECG, they said it's easily confused with EEG because EC and EE sound kind of similar. So it's like a way to designate, you know, not an EEG. So EKG was the like what we call it a lot, but EC, I hear a lot of it called ECG in the hospital. So. Um, ECG is the same thing as EKG. It means the same thing. Why are there, why are there two different abbreviations? When the, when the word electrocardiogram is translated into German, it's spelled electrocardiogram with K. So EKG is the same. Um, some people choose to say the ECG based on translation of this. So that's where that, where that came from. Both are correct. School, um, EKG was like the thing you do in the car with like 
Oh, okay. Like a three. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 I hear Bill. I don't really know. That's a that's a pretty that's a good way of designating it too. He said that um, ECG was kind of more like a three or five lead, and the cart, the roll around cart, the ten lead, um, or called twelve lead, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the cart was called an EKG. So uh, when he went to biomed school, so that's a, that's a good way of looking at it too. But I've heard you call both, and it's they're both right. If you say EKG, you're like I'm not sure what you're talking about. So what makes that automaticity? We have we have a built-in pacing system in our heart. Is what makes that automaticity. There's it starts with the SA node, which stands for sinoatrial node. Its location is on the right atrium, so on the top right front of the heart. It's the natural pacemaker of the heart. That's what the heart initiates. It's responsible for normal cardiac production. Proper filling and ejection of blood in the four chambers causes the aorta to track and fill the ventricles. When I first um, started my new job at UC Health, I went in for a checkup, just a regular checkup um, for a thyroid medication that I take. And I went, went there and they would call me in the back and got my vital signs done. My heart rate was 140 beats per minute when I was just sitting there in the, the waiting room in there. You know, they told me your heart rate's really high. I said, Well, how much is it? 140. Oh, wow, that's really high. Who's your primary care doctor? Like, never a question you want to hear when you're just on a routine visit. Oh, they're right across the street. Okay, we're going to send you over across the street. Send me over there. I got an EKG. Doctor comes in and says, Hang on a little bit. We're going to wait. We're going to uh, check into some things and we'll let you know what we're going to do with you. Uh, Something bad's going on. You know, I, I, why is my heart rate 140 beats per minute? Send me over to the cardiologist's office, back across the street where I came from, different floor. They did another EKG on me. Then, then finally, the cardiologist comes in and tells me, you have atrial flutter. So I had a problem between my SA node and my AV node that that SA node was not sitting that path, that the electrical path was not directly going, it was going everywhere. And so it was causing my atria to just flutter, not really pumping as much anymore. Um, luckily, they have a procedure for that. But one of the things I had to take right away was blood thinners, because whenever you have a rhythm like that, the blood pools in the heart. It doesn't. It doesn't pump. And then when it pools, it can cause it can clot. And then when that clot, when you go back to normal rhythm again, then that clot pumps out and it goes to your brain, and then you have a stroke. So I just had to stay. I, here's some samples for I think with Elquist. Right now, and um, about a week later, I had a procedure done, and it's called a um, that's called a um, ablation procedure. And they go in there and kind of burn the pathways, they go for the crazy pathways, and try to get that just that NC node to go directly to the AV node, which is next on our list here of uh, of our of electrical conduction. The atrial ventricular node uh, location is the junction. Of the atria and the ventricles, <coughs> kind of where everything comes together in the middle of the heart. Just a drink of water here. So the, the, uh, it received conduction from an essay node. So when I had that water going on, it wasn't conducting straight away, it was going crazy. And then the, the uh, essay, the ventricle, our uh, AV node was working fine. That that 140 beats per minute that I had, that was actually my ventricular rate. And the cardiologist told me, like, your your atria is beating twice as fast as your ventricles are beating. So your actual your atrial rate is around 300, and your ventricular rate is 140. I'm like, wow, you know, I didn't even know if you get to 300. I thought, you know, I always was taught like 220. You know, like when you're figuring your heart rate for exercising, 220 minus your age times whatever 70 percent or 60 percent or whatever. You're exercising, but we have these arrhythmias, you can have crazy stuff going on. And one of the tricks he showed me, I said, How can you tell that that's um, atrial flutter? He said, What you do is you turn the EKG upside down, and he said, It looks like a sawtooth on the top. Is how it, it was very obvious when he showed me because 
I was looking at it, but because the atrial waves were overlapping, we'll see that when we look at all the waveforms a little bit, but it was overlapping because there's two every time instead of just one every time. So AV node, SA node to AV node. AV node release the pulse down to the ventricles to the bundle of his. Bundle of his branches into the right bundle and the left bundle, each respective to each ventricle, right and left ventricle. These bundle branches break out the Purkinje fibers. So this is the electrical conduction for all of your heart. This SA node, AV node, bundle of his fibers. This leads to ventricular contraction and ejection of blood. So that's how your ventricles pump this through that SA known the electrical conduction, electrical physiology. When there's problem with your heart, like that ablation procedure that I have, um, or pacemakers can be used for, like that's what pacemakers do is they take the place of maybe the SA node and that does that part of your um, electrical conduction for electrophysiology. There's a lot of different crazy stuff I found when I sat at atrial uh, Water, I started studying arrhythmias a little bit. I, I never knew there were so many different arrhythmias of the heart and so many different things that can go wrong. And so many, it's just amazing to me that, you know, like you live, the average age is what, 78 years old or eight years old or whatever it is now. I don't know what the average age in America is. But you think how many times your heart beats in those amount of years because you're doing, you know, normal is 60 beats per, per minute. So over 24 hours, how many beats, and then you know your whole lifetime. It, it's a lot, and you think, wow, that's pretty amazing that your body's able to do that. So this is the picture of the conduction. I don't have a cool uh, block diagram for this one, but this is a uh, electrical conduction. So down here is the septum, down the middle, which we said divide the right and the left side. The valves here, tricuspid and the mitral valve. Signal sits at the top right side of the heart, so the right atrium. AV node in the middle, kind of between the um, atrium and the ventricles. And this part down here is the bundle of his and the Purkinje fibers around this part. So this is what causes the ventricular contraction. Same with the AV node. And if the SA node is not working, there's what's called a rescue rhythm. And when we start having rescue rhythm, it's kind of like in the CBT course, we taught the chain of command, like the president, the vice president, and the, the speaker of the house. So if the, if the president wasn't able to do their job, then say no, then the vice president took over and it was kind of, uh, kind of still worked. But when that when it went down the chain of command and it came to the speaker of the house, you're in big trouble and your heart's really not working anymore and you need immediate cardiac intervention. So that's electrophysiology. And we're able to record electrophysiology by the waves that we see on the paper or on the monitor when we look at that. That's what all those waves are. We're looking at the electrophysiology. So here at the top, we have the start of the right ventricle or right atrium. We have the P wave, atrial depolarization. Depolarization is the relaxing, relaxing of that. So it's relaxing, but so it can build. polarization of, of the atrium, which is that P wave. <clears throat> um, atrial contraction goes to P wave. Then we have the Q wave, which the Q wave is the initiation of atrial, atrial uh, repolarization and then the ventricles starting to fire. And look at, like I always look at the bigger part, the biggest part of the waveform and figure that goes with the biggest part of the heart, which is the ventricles. So that's when the ventricles are pumping. And my slides kind of cut out down here. Um, you can see that the flow comes through this. Um, so SA node, AV node, um, bundle of his, Purkinje fibers kind of out of here. This is the ventricles contracting the QRS, QRS complex, our wave being the top part. And this, this waveform differs a little bit based on which lead you're looking at. The typical lead we look at is lead two. Uh, I'll, look, I'll talk about the lead wires in just a little bit. I heard someone say, I'm always saying, um, my wife spoke over fire saying, another nurse saying that I have, but I've been preaching for the last 15 years, I guess, or 16 years, 
of doing like this uh, CBT review. So QRS, then we have the T wave is the repolarization or relaxing of the ventricles. It's like that for the depolarization, repolarization, atria. Um, repolarization, so then we go to uh, is the, is the depolarization, relaxing of the ventricles, and we start over again. All that in like 60 minimums, probably 60 times per minute. Um, so one beat every second or higher than that because a lot of people I know my resting heart rate is higher than 60. Especially if I had some coffee or in front of a group like this talking, my heart rate's probably a little higher. So that's how we measure that electrophysiology, the SA node, AV node, bundle of this is all measured it's on the graph paper or on that monitor that we're looking at. Here's a little bit um, easier to understand. And this one has the depolarization. I can never remember which one's depolarization, which one's repolarization, but I just know that this is the high goal when the heart is pumping the big part. Um, T wave is the depolarization of the atria in response to the SA node triggering. So that's when it's filling. Um, P to R interval is the delay of the AV node to allow the ventricles to allow the filling of the ventricles. So here it's filling. And then QRS complex is the depolarization, depolarization of the ventricles. So depolarization is pumping, repolarization is relaxing. Um, triggers the main pumping contractions. And it's like I said, the ventricles are the biggest part of the heart, so you have the biggest waveform. ST segment, beginning of entry, uh, control repolarization should be should be fairly flat. And then the T wave is the uh, ventricular repolarization or the relaxing. So then we'll go back here and repeat again. Keep repeating again for how many years of your life. Hopefully, it never changes from that. Like, never have any uh, arrhythmias or any other problems, hopefully, in uh, your whole life. So, how do we measure that electrophysiology? We know we got a waveform there. We use electrodes that are placed on the patient's chest. <coughs> a typical cardiac placement is 3D. So if we have three bipolar things. This is called Eintopitz triangle. Eintopitz triangle meant um, lead one, then the pulling between arms from right arm to left arm. So the top up here. And the reason I have that on in mind is because there's one L meaning lead one. You'll see in a second, like each one has a, more, a couple more L's. Lead two measures the polar difference between Electrode on the right arm, electrode on the, on the left leg. So R A to L not here. This D2 also measures, what else does it measure? Breathing, respiration is from lead two. So if you have a problem with your respiration um, waveform. It could be something with your electrodes on lead two, your maybe your lead two leads. So that measures the impedance change. When you take a deep breath, your impedance changes across your those leads across right arm to left leg. It's the biggest part across there. As that as your chest rises and drops, that impedance changes, and you can that's how you get the waveform of the impedance, the respiratory rate on the monitor. And if you look on this one, I put two bells. Lead three measures the different polar difference between electrode on the left arm and left leg. So three L's, L to LL. So from there to there. And all these things are colored too. <coughs> but that was a guy who was saying that why don't write smoke over fire on the hallway. There's uh, my slide on smoke over fire. And that means white is on the right arm. So white on right, smoke over fire, what color is smoke? Black, gray, or red, like look outside, look to the west, and you'll see what color smoke is, right? All the fires we have burning in Colorado right now. It's kind of like grayish, blackish. Probably the closer we get, it's probably black. So black and fire is red. So smoke is on that left arm, black, and then fire is the left leg. 
So why did I write this book over fire? Another nurse saying like that, try to be right. Um, the same that I had earlier. Meaning that the white is on the right arm, smoke black is on the left arm, and then left um, over fire and red on the other leg. So that's how you can remember the placement of those three leaves. And I've actually been in, I've gotten the call on a monitor before, and the nurse had the leaves reversed. <laughs> and I said, I think I said to her, I spoke over fire. Oh, yeah, yeah. you know, how do you know that? Like, how do you know? Because it's kind of a nurse thing that why not write smoke over fire? And they were reversed and the read wasn't reading right on the monitor. I said, well, you know, you have the leads reversed. It's kind of an embarrassing moment for like a nurse whenever a biomed person points out something like that. They never want that to happen. Because usually they're the ones telling you like everything, that kind of stuff. Like, right? so it's nice to be able to know this stuff for troubleshooting. And I don't ever try to make anyone feel stupid and point out, oh, you're really not It's just like, hey, you know, it happens and people that people slip up or whatever and it's it's as you're looking at the patient why don't you know the patient's right instead of you're right which is the map so it's easy to kind of get mixed up that they're the opposite way of you are and if you look at all the pit all the drawings it's kind of the same way if you look at it the left side is always the right side you're looking at these drawings of ecg so it's i can see where it could happen Heart related body signs. What other stuff goes off the heart? What other things that we have that the heart affects? Blood pressure? Invasive and non invasive? The systolic measurement of the, of the blood pressure. What is that? That's the pumping of the heart. So it's going to be the higher number, the top number on your blood pressure. This is, is the pumping, the ventricles, ventricular contraction or polarization ejection of blood. From the heart. Diast uh, diastolic pressure, the number on the bottom. And I always remember systolic and diastolic. I always remember D for denominator, for diastolic, the number on the bottom, or D for down, it's on the bottom. So diastolic, systolic, and diastolic. So normally your blood pressure would be like 120 over 80. 120 would be your systolic, that's the ventricles contracting, pumping. So it's going to be higher. And then when it's relaxing, when the ventricles are relaxing, then it's going to be a lower number. That's the 80 part. Pulse oximetry, it measures uh, pulse and flow of blood and circulation of hemoglobin, the red blood cells, which also supply oxygen to all your cells, the red blood cells, hemoglobin. Cardiac output, talked about it a little bit ago. Cardiac output is your heart rate times your stroke volume. So uh, remember I say your heart rate can change. So your, uh, when your heart rate changes, your cardiac output's gonna change. In adults, your stroke volume can also change depending on needs. Kids um, can't change stroke volume. It's just heart rate changes in kids. And I don't know when you become from kid to adult in there, it probably varies from person to person. Um, but typically kids, change their stroke volume like adults do. We don't really even have to think about it. It just automatically does it based on demands and how much, how hard we're working or whatever, how much demand your body has for that cardiac output to change. And it also improves how much, around six liters per minute. I try to remember the three, there's three, three that are about, about six. So the blood volume is around 5.6 liters. So almost six liters. The lung volume is also right around six liters for a normal person, like your total lung capacity is normally around six liters, and then your cardiac output is normally around six liters per minute. Oh, I like the CBT review stuff from previous stuff. People in here that were in the CBT review class, I see I'm not in there yet. I remember that part. Yeah, 5.6 liters is normal blood. So all of the blood in your body in one minute. All of your blood is being circulated through your whole, every amount of blood, 5.6 liters of blood you have. So you're pumping about six liters per minute, a little bit over all of your blood in one minute pumps through your body. So if you have a big injury somewhere and you're pumping blood and it's going, you know, not contained in your body anymore, a some kind of trauma, one minute you can bleed out if it's bad, big enough hole. One minute you have no more blood. 
and kind of a little bit scary to think about that. This is a 12-way ECG. This is the cart that Brian was talking about, or EKG, if you want to call it that, from the, what Brian said. Um, this one looks at lead one, lead two, lead three, and then we go up to ABR, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is you know, the V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, and then down at the bottom we see this piece here is all lead two. That's kind of the typical configuration of a 12 lead printout. And I had, I brought up, um, I actually took a picture of a printout that I did, and I kind of updated my slides, but when I sent my slides to these guys, I didn't want to change everything like last minute because I wanted the presentation to match what they had. So um, I took a picture of it. And at the bottom of this paper, you'll see like some numbers and that kind of thing. And I'll talk about it when we get a little further down in these slides. 12 leads. Right? I'm white and right. Black is a smoke over fire. Left arm. Left leg. Green is your right leg, or sometimes called a reference lead. Um, since it's a reference, I kind of remember green like brown, green for brown, I guess, because like, brown is kind of a reference for like AC voltage. Um, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, they're all around, and they're on the, on the connector usually. They go around the heart from V1 down to V6, down there on the, around the side here. So if I count these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What's going on? Why is it the twelve leads? Only ten leads. So we have those augmented leads. If you remember a couple slides ago, these guys, the ABR, ABL, ABF. Those are called augmented leads. Augmented leads are an augmented voltage. They're calculated. So it's not actually a lead wire. It's just a calculation based on those other, other uh, lead wires that we have. And what it's trying to do is trying to get a 360 degree view of the heart, which we'll see in just a minute. Um, but ABR is augmented voltage right arm. So if you're having problems with ABR, it's not, you're not ever going to find those leads. I can hear, start looking at all the leads in the, and on your simulator, you don't have an ABR, ABL, ABF piece on there, but that's how you get the 12 leads. And remember that these um, are just a reference lead. So all these are in reference to that. So that's, I mean, that, if that one goes out, everything's like pretty much done. You're, you're breathing. But these are, these are, uh, these leads do not have an electro connection. The augmented leads. So, what does this look at? This why do we have? Why do we need all those leads? Twelve leads like that? Well, it's looking at a whole view of your heart, and they can tell based on the weight, which is probably a lot more advanced than any of us need to ever get, and probably more than I probably know to be able to teach a class on that. More of a cardiologist thing. They can look at each way. <coughs> the big one that we look at is always lead two, right? That's because that's the biggest waveform and easiest to see on the monitor. And most monitors, that's what they measure in its lead to. But when you start looking at all these different leads, you can start seeing like where there's an injury, where that where that SA node to AV node to bundle of his, where that's not working correctly, and the waveform reflects it. So you can tell, oh, there's a problem maybe at the um, right ventricle based off of this waveform, where it's you know too too high or too low, or this, or the delay time is too much, or whatever. There's so many different measurements you can do on ECG um, that is more cardiologist-based, but that's what all these leads are doing, is looking at the whole view all the way around the whole heart, 360-degree view. Graph paper. I wanted to, to talk about this a lot, because it seemed like, remember in the CBT review, a lot of people don't know a lot about the graph paper and what all those little squares on there and what, the, what they stand for and how come we have all those little squares and what, what's going on when we have all those little squares, what do they mean? So going across, it's kind of, is anyone using an oscilloscope in here? 
I feel old because I know I use people that don't sit when they use the oscilloscopes. And like when you get the oscilloscope out of work, everybody's like, oh, look at that. You know, they're like, what is that? You know, I, I, it's kind of an older thing that people don't use as much anymore. You don't really use an oscilloscope. But I think of like an ECG the same way. The oscilloscope across the horizontal line is time. That's how long it takes. And then up and down, but two is how much voltage is there up and down. So it kind of does the same thing. You can actually put an ECG output on your oscilloscope and you can read a lead, you know, lead like your ECG waveform. It'll look just like it does on the monitor on an oscilloscope between those leads. If you have the settings right on your oscilloscope. And usually there's like if you're looking at um, sometimes there's like an R trigger in, in Duke Medicine. Um, I know all defibs have usually an output um, for the R trigger. And sometimes it goes to the monitor, it feeds off the monitor to the to the defib. Like the monitors have an output, like it's the Phillips monitors that I remember have a jack that you can plug in, like a stereo jack that plugs in and it goes out. It goes to sometimes to the um, to the um, ultrasound when the ultrasonographers in there, they plug in the monitor and get that output for the R wave, the trigger, they can look at the R wave during their studies. But if you did the same thing and put it on an oscilloscope, you'd get the same waveform as what you're getting on the monitor with the right settings. So normal paper speed is 25 millimeters per second. Those little bitty squares are millimeters on the paper. Alternate speeds, which hardly ever get used. The reason why they would do an alternate speed is that speeds up that feeds more paper faster. So if they wanted to spread out that waveform, look at smaller differences in electrical conductivity. The, the cardiologist can spread that print out by printing faster at a higher speed and be able to see and measure better resolution because you know it's bigger to picture basically like your phone, like if you're looking at a picture and you do that and make it bigger. It's kind of the same thing, making that way more bigger across that paper. So 25 is pretty typical, and most printouts when you see are 25. Typical amplitude. Is 10 millimeters per millivolt. So one millivolt equals 10 millimeters. So we look at that and we think, oh, look at all that. You know, like, I'm here, you see I have an hour wave there, and an hour wave there. Now one, two, three, four, five. It starts a little bit before five there, so that's almost 60 beats per minute. <laughs> we look at this timing piece. As the heart rate goes up right here, if I count it, we're going to be one, two, three, four, five, approximately. One, two, three, four. Sorry, miscounting. Only four right there. And this heart rate is 75. It says, if we look over here, there's five right there, 60. So these bold lines. In each one. So as you see, though, there's 300 beats per minute, 150, 100, and so on. And the faster the closer it gets. So that's where maybe that same chart, that chart speed, if they wanted to spread it out, if you have a high heart rate, they can spread out that printing instead of 25 millimeters per second, they can go to 50 or 100. If you have a real fast heart rate, and then it kind of spreads it out a little bit. You look at the different pieces of the PQRCT waves that look better. <clears throat> Down here at the bottom says lead to um, beats per minute. Graph paper timing. ECGs are normally printed on a grid, which we saw in that paper. The horizontal axis represents time, the vertical axis represents voltage, kind of like the oscilloscope that I was talking about just a minute ago. A small box is one millimeter by one millimeter. It represents 0.1. Millivolts or point zero 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 one millivolts is it, or volts if we did the decimal form. Mostly for the CBT people, because when you do that, you have like just a generic calculator. So when you calculate, you have to calculate that. Now what's the hurry here? What's the voltage? It's it's conversion is that. Um, 
So the way that I treat this small box um, point one uh, I'll get it just a second. Large box is five by five and represents 0.5 millivolts amplitude and 0.2 seconds. So if I look across there, I know that 10 millimeters equals <clears throat> 10 millimeters equals one millivolt. So I can take one millivolt divided by 10 and I get this number right here, 0001, 0.1 millivolts. And I know that um, time is 25 is one second. So I can take one second divided by 25 and I get that 0 0.04 seconds. That's where those numbers come from. That's what those little graphs piece, pieces mean. The box box is represented by a mirror line, and, this, and uh, the smaller boxes are just the lighter lines. Um, I have the equation down here 0.4 times number of squares. Um, answer one divided by um, answer times 16 equals the rate. That's how I came up with these numbers up there. So this is a graph paper again. One millivolt is 10 millimeters high. Remember, this is your reference pulse. So when the doctor's looking at it, they actually get out the caliper and they measure the different pieces of the waveform to tell, like, how high is the QRS? How, how what's the amplitude of the QRS? Is it high enough? But how about what's the amplitude of the P wave? What's the amplitude of the T wave? What's the time between the P wave and the, the Q wave? What's the S to T delay in there? Delay. How long is that? So they actually measure that with calipers, but this is telling them it's one millivolt. And we'll see that on the printout that you have to get the measurements so you know where to base, where to base your measurement off of. Because if you don't have that reference, what if the setting is, you know, if it's 1.5 per, you know, um, so one, one per, uh, 1.5 millivolts per 10 millimeters. You know, so you have a reference that you can go by, or the cardiologist has a reference that they go by. And our, for our stuff, I'll talk about what we need to know on that calibration pulse in just a minute when we look at the graph paper. So, what do you need to test an EKG or ECG? ECG simulator, just the little, I like the SIM sticks, but there's so many different ones on that market that you can do so many different things now. Um, set it to 60 beats per minute. Why 60? One every second, right? One beat every second. So we know in one second we should have 25 millimeters of paper because our speed is 25 millimeters per second. So one beat every second. Then we count the squares. Um, it should be five big squares or 25 small squares. We should have it consistent as we go across, especially on the ECG cart. Um, maybe not as much on like a deep print, print and like a print. I call those recorders, the other one's like a printer. The print is usually the accurate one. The recorders are maybe not as accurate, but you want them to be the same, all consistent. Instead of slower and faster and slower, you know, you have to have problem with your recorder. That's how you test your recorder and your printer. Speed is by counting those squares. So, look at this 12 ABC gene. If we look at the mean, we get the What will I increase this height? I'm going to look at this one. This one right here. And I can see like right at the bottom, like I look at this graph paper here. And see, this one starts at this line right here. One square, two squares. Um, it's, it's one square across, which is the, or one big square across, five millimeters across. That's the standard calibration pulse. And I see that the edge is square. That tells me if the signal is dampened or not. If the signal is dampened, that edge will be rounded. That's what's very amplified. It used to be in the old days something that we actually adjusted, and no longer do we really adjust the. The um, dampening of ECG, it's usually, I think it works on the feedback and it, it adjusts. Um, not something that we really even get into now in circuits, but in the 
old days, there actually used to be like a screw you could turn, a pot that you could turn and adjust that dampening if your waveform was not square like that. And then look at this, and it's two squares high. You know, like that's one millivolt. So then when we reference like this voltage here on this Q, on this R wave, we, we can look at that and it starts at zero. This is all the zero line where it goes across where that piece starts at there. So anything above it is positive voltage, and anything below it is a negative voltage. Like down you know, here, these are negative voltages because they're remember it's in reference to um, that right thing. So some of them are positive points, some are negative points. Um, so we can look at that and say oh, this is about one millivolt high. And that's what the cardiologist uses this for when you look at this. Same with this one down here, and they measure this is the two we talked about. So that's that's what we're looking at. And that's what we wanted to read on the CG simulator. So if we ever have to get out on our paper speed, we can always set our sim to 60 per minute and count do the um, do the uh, squares because we have a known good beats per minute, a known reference. Um, these are the numbers that I have on this page. Get the decimals and all that. So, amplitude and time. It's troubleshooting. Noise on EKG not picking up the lead. What would you do first? What do you typically do first when you have ECG noise and get called to wherever? What do you do? How long have those electrodes been on that patient? What what I normally do is see if I can if I can remove the leads from the patient and put them on my simulator. That's like number one thing I want to do. Sometimes they tell me no that I can't do that, but like that same thing about the printout speed, the 60 beats per minute. If I put it on my simulator, I know I have a good signal. I know I have a good pollution out of that metal, metal on the metal pollution. So if I have a good readout on my simulator, then I know it's nothing with the lead wires, I know it's nothing with the monitors, nothing with the cabling. I can pretty much eliminate all the parts that I can maybe do something about and tell them like I need to do something with the patient, like Bright said, maybe you need to change those electrodes out. Because they have electrodes have a, have a limited time. The the um, dielectric compound that's in there, that, that gooey stuff that's in the electrodes, it dries out over time. And you should change them. I think it's every day. I think it is what. And if, and if the pack, when they open the pack up, they have all these electrodes in there. They do it over to the air. Same thing can happen to that. And also an electrode box. I've seen this on a, a EKG cart before. Date. There's a date, there's an expiration date on that box of electrodes, and I've seen those a lot of date, especially on uh, EFIP pads. Everybody probably knows that when you like, check the EFIP pad when you do your EFIP on the EFIP and see if the EFIP pads are out of it because they have an expiration date too. Same reason why that electro, that's an electrolytic in there, it dries out over time, that's why they have an expiration date. So I've seen that for most of the EKG carts. Mostly in clinics where they don't really use EKG card all the time. They, they, you know, they do an EKG card like every few months or whatever. And they open the pack up and they, oh, well, let's use this pack. It's already open. We put it on there. This degree is like, I don't know what's going on. We call, call you guys in, call you in there and hook it up to your SIM. Oh, it works great. My SIM. Start looking for other models. You know, you don't have the patient there, so you don't always want to look at the dates on the um, pad and see if, when they expire. And maybe you can kind of maybe even take a cap out and feel how skewy it is. And you can even put the pads on your sim on some sims, and you can get a reading on your simulator too on the metal part, depending on the sim that you have. Check. So if you can't do that um, with the with the simulator, check all your, your leads on your monitor. On the ECG carts, one of the things that I always do. Is they have the main they have the main cable that goes out and then it goes to the box right that's i call that like the trunk cable and then the lead wire cables come from the box out to the patient each individual lead wire and then they have those little baby guys that like 
sometimes with the little alligator clips on the end. Those little bitty guys, the they're, they're ones I'm used to are black. Those little bitty guys, they break often. How do you check those? You know what I do? I just pull on I put one hand on the on the part that connects into the cable and I put the other hand on the alligator clip and just gently pull on it. If I can feel it, it kind of feels like a rubber band a little bit, that means it's junk. Throw it away. That's an easy way to tell it. And then you know, I can put it on your sim, you kind of move it around and start seeing which one makes the most noise when you have it on the sim, then you know that leads probably bad. Sometimes it's obvious you can look at it and see like corrosion or whatever on the on lead wires. So they don't get cleaned or don't get um, fixed, you know, cleaned up in between uses or gel or something to try on. Um, so I said I'm a patient, check the patient, um, check the electrodes in place. And it seems how many people have been on call and they um, went there to the um, to the unit and they said, well, we've replaced all the wires and we've replaced all the electrodes. Isn't that what they always say, right? The first thing they say. Oh, we replaced all the electrodes and all the wires. Just a minute ago, we did all that. Well, can you just, like for me, being here and watching, uh, can, can you just do it for me just for entertainment? Like replace those electrodes again, just so I can see. And you know, like before you, after you check the expiration date on that, box, that box of whatever their electrodes they're using, can you just do that for me so I see the uh, that they're changed because I'm not calling you on but you know, I want to just see this happen for myself. You know? and, oh my gosh, it stopped working. What happened? I don't know. I changed those just a little bit ago, like a day ago or whatever. Why, you know? Nine times out of ten, that's usually the problem is those electrodes. And usually you want to do like an alcohol prep. And they want to wipe the skin because that wipes away the oil. So um, kind of wraps up the skin a little bit, gets all that, gets it dried out so that that. Electrolyte and the electrolytic element um, electro will make the best contact with the patient. It should be a little bit redder. Yeah. 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 The time where I was calling in, they had an elderly woman who was, they were getting, her EKG was everywhere. And they had changed the pads. And they were still there. I just waited, I said, wait it up. Minute. Let's see what happens. What happens? Her skin was so dry that they went to the gel. Ah, and they placed the skin on her to where they can start to read the and everything about them. Everything off of the Yeah. Also. Yeah. And dry skin sometimes. Maybe it depends on the climate where you live at, probably too, on the humidity, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, here in Colorado, it's always pretty dry, so. Yeah, I'll agree that it, it, it's different. It's kind of funny because like elderly people versus like um, kids, totally different problems that they have. And also hair, like men that have hair in their chest can also be a uh, problem for ECG uh, lead, lead problems. Um, I don't want to go into that procedure. I have everything got I have no hair that procedure. Everything got shaved off. Just so they had, remember they needed to stick on me. I think they had the deep dip on there. They had something that from the procedure on there from the ablation. They had all of, I had little marks everywhere all over my chest and no hair there. I told my wife, pretty much did. I was like, did all my hair, all my chest hair is great now from getting shaken all shaved off. It was pretty rough. Pretty great before that. Um, but yeah, other people have giant skin. Especially teenage, maybe oil or skin, that's where that electrode, the alcohol um, white kind of comes in. Um, and kids, a lot of time, little kids move around a lot during that. And movement can cause artifact also on an ECG. So, those are some troubleshooting tips. Um, anybody else? It's really hit though, I guess. Does anybody else have anything that they've seen? Yes. Yeah. So the the book on the school, um, the only thing that they said. And unfortunately, hospitals buy the cheapest possible electrodes most of the time. So a lot of times you have a package, it just dust comes out, it comes like, oh, that one's inspired. Um, but 
they said that in, in the most, most designs of the electrodes, we want to use a bubble. I mean, even if it's just down oh, when you place it on the patient, give it a little push and rub with your finger. Uh -huh. Because that stuff has that like, gel kind of squeezes out a little bit. And, like start gelling together. Mm -hmm. So to give it a little push and rub. Okay. That, that helps that work faster yeah. and get a better connection. Yeah. Good to know too. Yeah, you tell them to change the pad, they just kind of slap them on there. And they and stick them on there, and then they don't do anything when they put the leads on. Well, they don't get that little extra thing digs into the skin. It's funny how all the, a lot of the, the majority of the time it's not the lead wires and not the other people, except for those little extension wires that I was telling you about with the alligator clips on there. I've seen those. I don't know why those things. They that that company uh, must have like an engineering guy, or an engineering person. That designs them so that they fail every so many uses, you know, because they kind of like design failures, so you have to buy more of them. Because those little extension wires seem like they go bad a lot. Maybe they're just stretched out a lot or whatever on their ECG carts. I've just replaced a bunch of those over the years. But one, usually it's not the lead wires. Another one that has high failure rate is the radio loosened um, leads they use in the cat oh. lab. Those are really brittle oh. and they'll look great more often. Than the you know, traditional conducting ones. Um, so, you know, working like vascular cat lab, those tend to go out faster. Do they replace those every every case, or are they just every so often, or just last for a while? I think probably get about a month out of wow. those. I mean, they're not continuously on yeah. the time of use like patient ones are, but they do like especially. Do you actually, can you see the breakage in those? Physically, like look at it and observe that breakage, or is it sometimes x ray? Can you x ray it and see if there's breakage? Yeah, no, no. since you're in the cat lab, I guess you can just x ray it. This time they break right in from the <coughs> stamp, it just has to get wider. Yeah, but that, that's another high like, failure offset. I've seen that on MRI leads too, that on um, like in vivo monitors, they break usually where the strain reliefs are, like usually at the try at the end of the trunk cable, they break. But that's usually something you can look at and see, you know, it's like it's something obvious that you look at because what is it that's like you always look at things like a circuit board, you smell a circuit board, right? You always look for the obvious stuff first, right? That's a biomed thing. Everybody does that in biomed. Well, it's probably a number one troubleshooting tip, right? And for that experience too, for the for the weeds was um, the shielding that they use for the MRI weeds. Um, can get damaged internally and you oh, can't wow. see it. So um, it'll work, but it'll create so much noise that that you can't get a good reading. Oh, so from the shielding, shielding. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. okay. It's got yeah, about that because the MRI now yeah. shielded the ICG. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That would be hard for you to see that. Huh? Yeah, it's the shielding case. Sometimes it's good to have like an extra cable when you go to trouble and you just swap them out. Let's try this cable. And maybe the whole cable, the trunk cable, everything, but it's like let's try this. You know, oh, we've already replaced it. Yeah, again, you know. Well, here's another one that I know is working. You know, I put it on my sim, it's doing it. Let's try that cable. So that's the skin prep part. Um, does not read on lead one or lead two, but it reads on lead three. So I think on my last slide here, um, to say it, but normally, if you know, like you want to go through the leads, like lead one, two, and three, look at lead one, two, and three, and kind of compare. If you know the leads on the noise is all on one lead, then you know it's only related to that one electrode. That's kind of what this one goes along with. So, this is one of those process of elimination questions. If you know lead one, two, and three, um, tells you that um, LA is good, LA is good because yeah, which is lead one, then you have. Um, it says it read, it does not read on lead one or lead two. So we're going to go to the left arm, this lead one, so that's not working. And then right one on the left leg is not working. Sorry, process of elimination. Um, LA is good, LL is good, leaves the right arm on this map. So it wasn't working on the right arm. It does not read on lead one or lead two. So lead one has right arm in common because it's right arm and left arm, and then right arm, left leg. So lead three was good, left arm, left leg. 
So we know the left arm is good. We know the left leg is good, which needs the right, tells us the right arm is bad. So process of elimination. Sometimes it's like, think about that a little bit difficult. Please watch it. Where do these go again? Do the little drawing or start the same. Um, uh, this is a question. So yeah, that's that's where I got some of these problem solving is uh seabed questions. Is you know, like this is one of the ones that something like this is what they would like to ask on the CBT test. And I think one of the ones I have on my practice test for CBT stuff said, you know, like noise on these leads. You know, I think one of the answers was like an AV, uh, an augmented lead answer. So I knew right away, oh, you know, I know there's not an augmented electrode, so I can fill that one away right away. CBT stuff. Questions, anybody? I really appreciate all your feedback and all your interaction. I saw a lot of people shaking their heads during the presentation. I like to see that. And he's like, yeah, this stuff. You know, and this is a good review, hopefully, for you. And it kind of brushes up on stuff that you haven't really looked at in a while. But I like seeing all the nodding heads. Um, thanks for everyone for joining the class and uh, enjoy the Colorado Mixer. <laughs>